Hello and welcome to all those tuning in. Thank you so much for joining us for the launch event for Me Maria Surviving the Storm, co-hosted by Voice of Witness and Haymarket Books. I'm Ella Banerjee, Community Partnership Coordinator at Voice of Witness, and I'm thrilled to be introducing this important project and the speakers today. Before we begin, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that if we were gathering physically together in one place, we would recognize and thank those whose land we are on. Since we are virtual today, I'll share that I'm calling from Maloney Land, also known as Berkeley, California. I encourage folks watching in the chat to share the Indigenous lands you are calling from as well. And if you don't already know, you can look up your location in the website native-land.ca. This event will have live closed, closed captioning available in both Spanish and English. The instructions for accessing the captions will be posted in the chat. Today's event kicks off the launch of this incredible new book in the Voice of Witness series, Me Maria, Surviving the Storm, edited by Risa Chansky and Marcy Zen. All of you know, almost exactly four years ago in September of 2017, Hurricane Maria engulfed Puerto Rico for over 30 hours. The storm was brutal, but there was more catastrophe to come in the, in the aftermath. Lack of government support and aid left many in the archipelago without housing, electricity, clean drinking water, food, and medical care for months. Years later, Puerto Rico is still recovering. Me Maria, Surviving the Storm, is an oral history collection that brings together 17 first-person stories from Puerto Ricans that explore how communities come together in the wake of disaster, what it means to be a U.S. citizen in a colonial context, and how precarity and inequity are exacerbated on the front lines of the climate crisis. Me Maria is the latest book in the series from Voice of Witness, which is a human rights oral history nonprofit that works to amplify the voices of people impacted by and fighting against injustice. Voice of Witness provided oral history training, editorial guidance, and funding for this project, and the book is published by Haymarket Books, an independent publishing house based in Chicago. The book was officially released just two days ago and is available for purchase now on the Haymarket website. Me Maria is very accessible for readers of all, of all backgrounds, including students. We also have free corresponding lesson plans that educators and advocates can download directly from the Voice of Witness website. I'm now honored to introduce the critical speakers for today's event. Dr. Risha Chansky is a professor in the English department at the University of Puerto Rico and Mayaguez and the co-editor of this new book. Risha worked with Voice of Witness and more than 150 of her students to collect and amplify the stories of hurricane survivors across the archipelago, which blossomed into a large-scale public oral history project and led to the development of this book. Risha will be moderating the event today. Zaira Arvela Odisea is the first narrator in Me Maria and is also the curriculum specialist for the project. She is a writer, editor, and educator with a focus on English language learners and equity. Zaira and her husband survived Hurricane Maria by floating in an air mattress for 16 hours trapped inside their home. Zaira's story in the book highlights several failures in the federal dis disaster response system, which led them to remain homeless for well over a year after the hurricane. We also have another narrator from the book with us today, Laurel Cubano Santiago. Laurel is a community organizer and the founder of the Old San Juan Heritage Foundation, as well as the community art center, Colectivo Perl Arte. After Hurricane Maria, Laurel coordinated mutual aid efforts with her community to feed hundreds of people, despite not receiving any aid from the supply ships that docked just minutes away from their neighborhood in San Juan. And our last speaker is Brenda Flores Santiago. Brenda was a student in Risha's English class at the University of Puerto Rico, where the storytelling project first began. Brenda interviewed her father, whose narrative in the book focuses on navigating the dire lack of support from FEMA and the crumbling healthcare services in the aftermath of the hurricane. Brenda recently left Puerto Rico to begin her graduate program in translation and interpretation at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Now, before I pass the mic over to our speakers, we'd like to share a brief video that gives you a behind the scenes, on the ground look at the Me Maria project. Thank you again for tuning in, and we hope you enjoy today's important conversation. Everyone has a story. in my house for 
10 plus hours floating on an air mattress. I have to talk to myself in third person and say, I could die today. Cuando llega la luz, no hay agua. Las personas hacían filas enormes para poder suplirse de combustible. Pasaban días y días en la gasolinera. Se dieron incidentes donde detenían a los camioneros y los asaltaban y les jugaban el combustible porque era tanta la necesidad. There was no FEMA, there was no Red Cross, there was none of that. I didn't run into any of these groups. No había señal de teléfono, no había internet. Entonces, pues, todo el mundo estaba afuera. People would ask us and say, pero Zaira, you know, like, you lost everything. I mean, what is everything? You know, so my couches floated. You know, my tiles were popping off the ground, and I was looking at a ceiling for many hours. Yeah, but I'm here, and I have my life, and, and I get to start over. And I learned so many things about my, my own humanity and about the power of community. We think that Puerto Rico is not a third world country, but when you go, you see it is, you know? And especially after an event like the hurricane, this idea of Puerto Rico having the benefits of the United States, is a lot, huge one. We can't vote. What's the reality? The only reality you're going to find is if you talk to the people that live the everyday life there. A pesar de los pesares borinquen sigue a pesar de los pesares borinquen vive a pesar de los pesares borinquen sigue a pesar de los pesares borinquen vive nuestra raza es luchadora valiente y firme y a pesar de los pesares I'd like to say thank you so much to our hosts for having us here this evening. Thank you to Voice of Witness and Haymarket Books. I'd like to say thank you very much to my friends who are here with me tonight, Fyra, Brenda, Burrell. Thank you. Five weeks after Hurricane Maria made landfall in the Puerto Rican archipelago and decimated every space it touched, our courses at the University of Puerto Rico began once again. As a scholar of autobiographical narratives, a person who studies how people tell the stories of their lives, I invited each of my students to tell me something that they were carrying with them, something that was a burden from the hurricane that they needed to let go of. I received over 100 hurricane memoirs of experiences in Maria. All of them were written with pen on paper, and I read them by candlelight because it would be long months until we again had electricity. Those narratives told me of students sitting in their homes as their roofs were pulled off and their possessions followed afterwards out into the hurricane. The words screaming and crying were repeated again and again. I read by candlelight on until I came to Alejandra's narrative. Alejandra told me that the hardest moment of her life was when she watched her neighbors dig two graves in their yard because family members had not survived the aftermath of the storm. Because in her words, the electricity remained off and the hospital remained closed. Reading Alejandra's narrative made me want to do something for my students, wanted me to help resituate them after disaster, show them that their voices mattered. At that time, I was going to a cafe in the plaza of my town, Cafe 413. And I was going there because it had a generator that provided electricity and it had a mobile hotspot 
they generously allowed me to make this my office for long months. One of the first emails that I received in that makeshift office was an email blast from Voice of Witness saying, we have an open call. Do you have an idea for a collection of oral histories? Do you have stories that need to be amplified? I knew I had some stories that could be told in this way. And I thought that maybe my students would be interested in collaborating with me so they could not only tell the stories of their lives, but they could enter their home communities and gather and disseminate stories of the hurricane and its long aftermath. I applied for the grant from Cafe 413 and was delighted to be chosen to collaborate with the Voice of Witness. Those 150 students that Ella mentioned were all trained in the ethical collection, transcription, translation, editing, and dissemination of oral histories. They all participated in this project, and it was my great joy to collaborate with them. Eight of the narratives in our book began in that class when many of us still did not have electricity, when some of us didn't have running water, and when all of us were insecure about our futures. The people who are joining me tonight are very special for many, many reasons. But I want to point to the fact that Syra is the very first person that I interviewed for this project. When we met for the first time, we met on a broken town plaza with very limited electricity and with the sounds of rebuilding all around us. Laurel is the very last person that I interviewed for this project. The day that our island shut down because of the coronavirus, the day we had curfews, the days we couldn't leave our homes, I was traveling across the main island of Puerto Rico with my collaborator, Marcy Denisak, as we raced to meet Laurel. We sat on her back balcony overlooking the ocean as we talked and talked, looking at the clock to see if we would make it home in time. Brenda is my beloved student. She is one of the very first students. This is obviously still very emotional for us, so please excuse us as we, we become moved by, by what we're talking about. Brenda was the very first student who joined this project. She has worked beside me for four long years as she worked to collect first her father's narrative, and that's something that she's worked on throughout the entirety of this project, but then as she committed herself to being a project translator, a project marketer, a project leader who has attended countless meetings with me. This is a very special grouping of friends. I'm glad that you are here with us tonight for this conversation. I'd like to take a minute to ask each of the folks who are joining me tonight if they'd like to say hello and like to say where they're joining us from. Uh, Laurel, would you like to start us? I think your microphone is still off, Laurel. Sorry, um, thank you for your beautiful introduction and for having me and for letting me be part of your beautiful project. Uh, my name is Laurel Cubano. I am the executive director of the Old San Juan Heritage Foundation. We are located in La Perla, which is an underserved community in Old San Juan. Uh, thank you, Lil. Yes, that's a great starting introduction. Thank you so much. Uh, Brenda, would you like to uh, introduce yourself and say where you're at tonight? Yes. Um, hi, my name is Brenda Flores Santiago. I am currently in Urbana, Champaign, Illinois. And the people that are native to this land are the Peoria, Cascasia, Yankasha, Fia, Miami, Mascouting, Odawa, Tau, Maesquaki, Kekapao, Madawatome. Um, uh, I'm sorry if I did not pronounce those names correctly. Um, wanted to about the people that rightfully own this land. Um, I'm super happy to be here and we with all of you guys in conversation. Thank you, Brenda. Saira? Hello, everyone, and saludos. I am Saira Arbelo Alicea. 
And today I am joining from my parents' home in Lattes, Puerto Rico, so the countryside and the island, main island. Uh, thank you to all three of you for joining me for this conversation tonight. I'm so happy to be here with you. We're going to start our program this evening with me reading a short excerpt from each of our narrator's um, stories. And then I have a question for each of them after I read that narrative. I'm going to start with Laurel and then I'll go over to Syra and then Brenda, I'll go to you. Um, this is a piece from Laurel's narrative, and I hope that you can picture with me La Perla perched on the ocean with the Caribbean breezes running through the building as we sit together and watch Laurel uh, as she smiles her beautiful, bright smiles and tells us this story. People here were and still are discriminated against because they are poor. We're literally outside of the wall of Viejo San Juan, one of the biggest tourist areas in Puerto Rico, and also a neighborhood where very affluent people live. I think we have one of the largest wealth disparities, if not the largest in the US. So that wall between the neighborhoods is literal, but it's also mental. I appreciate and love the historical wall, but I always wonder, how can I tear down that mental wall? Here and also in Puerta de Tierra, where my grandfather lived, are the communities where we've kept the poor. About 1,200 people live in La Perla right now. There are families that were born and raised here and pride themselves on that. The community is extremely vulnerable. Our people have been systemically treated badly all of our lives. Nobody is going to help our community because La Perla is also coveted now. This is prime real estate. In 2012, Donald Trump came here and he wanted to buy the land to turn this into Santorini or another Greek island community. If no help comes here, people are hoping that it becomes abandoned so they can just buy it up. That's what they want. That's why I say the lack of aid here is systemic. It is by design. Laurel, I think that's such an important story for us to begin with because it demonstrates that while the hurricane was a disaster, it was a terrible event, but it was an event within a larger context of colonialism and cycles of poverty. Could you talk to us a little bit more about that, Laurel? Well, yes, I can. Um, at that moment, when I was seeing all those ships, because there were hundreds and hundreds of containers of aid coming into Puerto Rico, and the lack of response from the government, it, it was, it made no sense. We are here two minutes away from where they are storing all of these containers and we don't see anything come out or have anything be distributed. The lack of response from the government was borderline genocidal. So, but before that we've been experiencing for the past 20 years, a recession. Um, which I think is also by design because there's a lot of hot money going around with all these politicians and the revolting door and then all of this debt has been accumulated but now the people is the one that has to pay for it. We are the ones that have been in, imposed these austerity measures 
And the lack of basic services for the Puerto Rican for the past 20 years have been decreasing constantly and, and horribly. So I say that, that it is creating circumstances to push us out of the island, to gentrify, and then they are giving all this tax incentive for Law 22 and Law 60, mm -hmm. which are the people that are coming here um, to defraud the IRS. Let's call it by its name. And there's nothing we could do about that because we are a territory. We are still a colony. We are under the US rule, okay? The president of the United States is our emperor because he has been imposed to us. So it's something that we have to, a difficult conversation that we need to start having right now. Yeah, yeah. Laurel, thank you so much. Um, and I think it's important for the people who are joining us tonight to know that the people of Puerto Rico are U.S. citizens, but they are U.S. citizens who may not vote for president who do not have voting representation in Congress. And so instead of being participants in government, they're ruled by government. And um, Laurel is referencing the PROMESA Act, which put a fiscal and oversight management board into place. And that board tells us how we're able to spend our money. And it has cut uh, health care. It has cut social services. It has cut education to the point where it has created a humanitarian crisis. And so our hurricanes, Irma and Maria and our swarm of earthquakes and COVID have come in the middle of an economic crisis that was created. Laurel, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to turn to Syrah's narrative now. And as Ella stated at the beginning, uh, Syra and her partner were able to survive massive flooding by floating on a torn and patched air mattress for hours. This is the excerpt from her narrative. When the door was finally open, I grabbed the backpack with all our important papers in it and passed it to the guy in the kayak. I slid off the mattress into the black water and pushed myself into the space where the door was. I put my hands on the top left and top right of the door and spread my legs the same way, holding them open so that I wouldn't go underwater. Only two or three strokes swimming got me past our balcony to the plastic kayak. I held on to some wires at the back end of the kayak and was pulled along with my legs out behind me, careful not to let them hang down in the water. There were lots of things in the water. Whole uprooted trees, guava, lemon, barbed wire, electric pole wiring, fences, lizards. I had lizards try to take a ride on me. I remember ducking so that I didn't hit the wires on a power line that was still standing. That's how high the water was. I was completely disoriented, had no idea where I was. The kayak just kept going over houses that were also underwater. And I would look down at them. Syra, thank you so much for sharing this very, very powerful story with us. Um, I'd like to ask you a little bit to tell us a little bit, please, about the contrast between 
this survival, these moments of survival that you share in your story and what happened in the aftermath. Can you tell us a little bit more about your story? What happened after this unknown person in a kayak came and rescued you? My pleasure. Well, at first we had, of course, no idea who this person was. It was two young men. And we found out who they were because I ended up writing a column for a local newspaper in Puerto Rico, uh, El Nuevo Dia. And people started commenting and saying, oh, I've heard about this story. And I think we know who the person is. And it kept on going word of mouth, which I think is a testament to what was happening uh, during and right after the hurricane. Without any telecommunication whatsoever, we went back to what you mentioned, Risha. We went back to pen or pencil and paper. We businesses went back to using spray paint to put messages on their windows and their doors for their patrons to know we are closed right now, but we'll open again and we will be okay. Um, I think the biggest thing for me was this contrast of being so close to a military facility being so close to a Coast Guard active base in the Western area of Puerto Rico in Aguadilla and thinking naively that someone would come, that they have all of these huge vessels that they can deploy in seconds and they have all of this technology and you're saying, if they're gonna help anyone, it's gonna be us. Much like Laurel, we were two minutes outside of the base so, and, and an airport. Our closets would shake, vibrate any time an airplane left. And you're thinking, if this area is flooded, someone with a military uniform, someone who is an official, a firefighter, a police officer, will come to our aid because we are right here. They can see the flood. They know they are houses and we are U.S. citizens. But of course, that wasn't what happened. We ended up discovering that the young man who helped us was a teacher's aide at a local military school in Aguadilla. And we figured that out a long time after all of this happened. And... I actually met him in person once, believe it or not, buying shish kebabs in Aguadilla. That is how we met, like how we saw each other face to face. And it was me who recognized his picture because I had looked him up online on social media as we weren't able to connect after the hurricane. And I stopped and I asked if that was his name. And yeah, it was him. And at that point, he was also holding another job as a construction worker. So I had a teacher slash construction worker who borrowed a kayak. And this was the person who helped us, not anyone official. And the only reason someone came to my aid and my husband's aid was because we had an an emergency whistle that we insisted on using because we had a flashlight at night and we would do light intervals through the water to some other light we could see across that fake lake. And there were two girls who picked up on the sound of the whistle and insisted that there were people over there. It was these young men, the only ones who listened to these girls call. Syra, as always, uh, I have chills from your story. And and um, I think one of the things that's always so impactful to me about your story is the ways in which strangers, these were not your best friends, these were not your family members, these were not people that you knew, strangers got together to help to save you and your husband and to provide for you. Thank you very much, Syra. Thank you. Um, Brenda and I, as, as I said in the beginning, Brenda and I have a unique relationship because we were a a faculty student partnership who worked so hard to hear her father's story and to listen to the things that, that he has to tell us. And I hope that, uh, when you read the book, you, you look at some of the very humorous and beautiful stories that Brenda's father, Luis, has about growing up 
in Junkos and, and growing up uh, in his family and with um, love and baseball surrounding him at every step of the way. And so what I'm reading right now is an excerpt from Luis's story that Brenda collected and I worked in partnership with her to uh, bring it to, to uh, this narrative. Um, Brenda's father, Luis, is a traveling salesperson and he's been working so hard after the hurricane to figure out how will he get food to all the sites that he's responsible for? How will he feed all of those people? But as he's worrying about putting food in the hands of people in his own home, his father, his own father is waiting for the dialysis clinic to reopen. This is the excerpt from Louise's narrative. My father needs to have dialysis every other day. Without his treatment, he can't live. After the hurricane, I had no work, no income. But in addition to that, there was no gas, water, or electricity, and no way to get the dialysis. The center where he goes for treatment stayed closed after the hurricane, and we didn't know when it was going to open again. There was no official information, no plan. We just heard that desperate people had stolen the diesel fuel out of the dialysis center's generator, so it couldn't work. Brenda, there, there are a lot of, of things going on in your father's narrative. It's such a rich story. And, and one of the things that we can um, think about here is that the, the supplies that FEMA was supposed to be circulating, which Laurel has mentioned, which Syrah has mentioned, your dad was on the forefront of seeing that those supplies weren't reaching the smaller grocery stores in communities and that they weren't being distributed in those communities. But there's also this very personal story woven into that as he's trying to help others, as he's trying to procure food for others, he also needs to take care of his own family, his father and, and you and your siblings and your mom as well. Um, I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit more about that and about maybe what has continued to happen to your dad. Yeah, as you mentioned, my father had a lot of responsibilities and he was juggling all of them in silence, as he usually does. Um, when I sat down to hear him and his narrative, I started to see a lot of things I did not know in the moment when I was actually living through it. Yeah. Um, uh, one of the things that occurred with FEMA was that the food, the the street, the things that he was supposed to deliver to the people and the municipalities that needed them because he is the sole distributor, they were taking the carriers and emptying them and utilizing them for FEMA, but they were not getting to where they were supposed to. So he was having this moment where he was really frustrated because he was like, "They're supposed to get it there." Like I'm. I totally understand what they're doing, what they're doing, but it's not getting to them. So what are they actually doing? Um, and it was a really frustrating moment for him because he was like, I'm, my hands are tied. I'm the person that they go to. My, ha my father has had that route as a salesman for 25 years since, I, since when my mom was pregnant with me. So these are not only his clients, they're like family. Um, uh, one of the, his clients from San Lorenzo, he's a really close friend to our to our family to the point where he would get give us gifts. So he has all of these responsibilities. And on top of that, my grandfather's health is on the line because of the same reasons, because of not having a plan by the municipalities, because of people that were being desperate. So you also get this mixture of emotions because you're frustrated, you're also mad, 
but you also understand what's going on, but it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Um, It's something that I will love, and I'm sure he will love to say that stop after (laughs) the hurricane and the months, but sadly it's something that has been going on Um, right now. There's a lot of problems happening with distribution on, on the island and on the main island and on the, our little sister islands like Vegas and Culebra, my dad is also the salesperson that distributes food um, to Vegas and Culebra. And right now, the he has clients that are not receiving the supplies that they need because of the strikes and huelgas that are occurring with the drivers because they're not being paid. So something that happened three years ago, about to be four, is still happening right now. And that sense of having your hands tied are still is still really present in his life. Yeah. Brenda, thank you so much. And I think it's very important for us to realize that Puerto Rico is an archipelago and there are multiple islands that are a part of Puerto Rico. And two of the easternmost islands are municipalities, uh, Culebra and Vieques, in which uh, multiple people live. And the um, way that you reach Culebra and Vieques is through ferry or through airplane. And after After the hurricanes, uh, the ferry was interrupted. It has not had stable service since Hurricane Maria in 2017 and Hurricane Irma, which which impacted those municipalities very strongly. And I think it's also important to note that the clinic in Culebra was destroyed and the hospital in Vieques was destroyed. And it is only through private citizens and foundations that the clinic in Culebra is rebuilt today. And four years later, the hospital in Vieques is not rebuilt at this time. So not only is there uh, no stable supply lines for the people in those municipalities, there is no stable medical care on Vieques either. And, you know, I think one of the very interesting things that is being said across these narratives from Aguadilla, from Juncos, from San Juan, is that the distribution and circulation of relief goods was not done in a manner that supported the people. And as a matter of fact, in several instances, the organizations that are supposed to support people took goods out of the hands of the people. And that's something that's very important for all of us uh, to be thinking about. What are those systems that are in place and how are those systems functioning? Um, Thank you, uh, the three of you, um, for allowing me to share pieces from your narrative and to ask you these follow-up questions. I appreciate that very much. Um, One of the things that I want to sort of pick out of this conversation and see if we can't have um, a little bit more uh, time dedicated to is this idea of what happened in our communities when we saw government failures at different spaces. Um, When I started this project, and this is a shared governance project, what that means is that students get to share in the decision-making processes with me. And I I remember very clearly having a a conversation in one of Brenda's classes in which I, I came in and I was like, I am very angry about the things and and I think we should be talking about how disappointed we are about the things. And the student said, you know, profe, yes, but what if we shifted a little and we talked about the community response and we talked about how everyday people became heroes, stood up in a moment when no one was coming for them and said, what can I do? And and that was a very important moment for me. And the project as a whole shifted to community response to disaster. And we know that there were government failures and the government failures are, rele- are, are revealed when we see the heroism of the people. And we know, you know, th- this term resilience, which is um, attached to Puerto Rico very often is, is a problematic word because the, the, the heroism is beautiful and wonderful and outstanding, but it doesn't excuse 
the government level failures. And so I'd like to ask each of you for a moment because each of you have participated in these wonderful projects where you've said, what can I do to help my community? What can I do? Where is my piece that I can add? And so I'd just like to ask you if you'd like to talk a little bit about this idea of community response and the ways in which you stepped up, the ways in which people around you stepped up, and, and the ways in which the communities of Puerto Rico stood up to help each other in this time of terrible crisis. Um, Syra, would you like to start us off in this in this conversation? Well, in the community uh, that suffered that big flood in Aguadilla, there were many families. And in fact, uh, the community is called Callejón El Pidio and is located in the barrio of Camaseyes in Aguadilla. And uh, as it turns out, which didn't surprise anyone, no one had come. No one from FEMA, no one from the municipality, no federal agency whatsoever had showed up and mm -hmm. the families were fed up. So our Avon lady in the community, uh, some retired folks uh, who live there, as well as several members with uh, varying functional ability who made the time, started mm -hmm. hailing the government agencies. And of course, because of, as I mentioned earlier, the neighborhood is so close to an airport, it means it is the port authority that you need to call for these issues. It also means that because of the flood and the emergency, you need to call on FEMA. It means that you need to reach out to the municipality of Aguadilla. So she took the time to write all of these letters. But most people in the community speak Spanish, and these are largely federal agencies. So they're not going to reply if you don't hail them in their language. Mm -hmm. And these were some of the struggles we were seeing. So, of course, they reached out. They knew I own a business and they knew um, I'm an educator. So they said, Saida, can you help us out with that? So my role was really showing up, being there mm -hmm. if it was needed, uh, providing translation or proofreading, uh, simple things like printing a document and uh, placing my signature somewhere. But the bulk of the work, the heavy work, it was done by the community. They were the only ones who got a representative from FEMA to visit and do a tour of the area. But to this day, nothing has happened for the community of Callejón El Pidio in Aguadilla. The family still lay, live exactly the same way. In my case, I used to rent at that point. So I did leave that community. We stay in touch. Yeah. And just to clarify here, the community that Cyrus is talking about is a community that was entirely underwater and they are not near the ocean and they are not near a river. It was the sewer system that flooded and overflowed. And when I mentioned the term black water in Cyrus narrative, the water was black because it was filled with poison from the sewer system. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Syra, thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that. Um, Laurel, would you like to talk about the same issue, this idea of coming together within the community, especially when there were uh, gaps and, and failures from the systems that are in place to support people? Yes, yes, of course. Saira, thank you for sharing your beautiful story. You're my hero too. Um, in La Perla, this is, we have to go back and understand the mentality of the people of La Perla, which is an underserved community, discriminated against, and, and they have been through a lot all over the, the decades. So when you think about that, think about that hurt people, hurt people. Um, and most of the people here don't support each other. That's one of the major issues that we have from a community like this. And they don't like talking to each other, even though their families are related. And after the hurricane and the government abandonment, we came together as a community. We took, we helped each other. Um, 
we were taking everything out of the streets, removing everything, helping the people. And at one point, we started cutting a tree that fell and we used that to start a fire and we cooked with the fire and everybody started bringing food to cook with. And that's how the community um, kitchen was open and we fed a lot of people over months. Um, breakfast, lunch, dinner, whatever we could do um, with the little budget that we had. And for 14 days in La Vela, we, we are two minutes away from all the container ships and all the humanitarian aid that was coming. And we are the neighbors of the governor of Puerto Rico, okay? For 14 days, nothing came into a devastated, underserved community two minutes away from the governor's mansion. Nothing. For months, nothing came from the government. Everything that came into this community was private benefactors, musicians, actors, private foundations. Um, it was total and complete neglect, even though it was very beautiful to see all the neighbors coming together to put the community back in order and back in place. And to this day, I don't know, maybe I, I'm talking badly about FEMA, but I don't think they help nobody from the community. All the houses that we have built have been private um, aid from foundations or musicians or actors or concerned citizens from the diaspora. We have had that a lot of support from them. So thank you very much. Um, but yes, it was chaotic, beautiful. And the sense of community that I saw at that moment, it's very necessary for everybody. People start doing and building community, start having an assessment of the professionals, of the teachers, of the lawyers, of the people that know how to do plumbing, electricity, mm -hmm. <laughs> the caregivers for the elders, that's very important. Plus the people that are gonna take care of our children while we take care of the disaster, because those are things we have to start thinking about, even though we don't want to, but... Yeah. Um, we are going to see a lot of larger events happen because of lower warming. So yes. please have that in mind. It's a difficult thing to process, but it will save lives, okay? Have that assessment of your communities. Start talking to each other. That's what the government don't want. They don't want us to know each other. Our, concerns, our needs, our weaknesses, our strengths, we have to know them, okay? Don't be afraid to ask the questions. Don't be afraid to start a conversation. That's what I took out of this experience. That's what I wanna share with everybody so that in advance, start taking these little actions that could save lives. Yeah, thank you so much, Laurel. Uh, I, I'm thinking about a couple of things from your story. You know, uh, having a stable refrigerator in Pearl Arte. And so people who need medication, people who need insulin, people who cannot live without that refrigeration and how Pearl Arte uh, uh, presented that for the community. And then thinking also about the group of children that you welcomed from the southwestern portion of the main island uh, uh, on December 28th, uh, uh, 2019, Puerto Rico started a cluster of earthquakes uh, called a swarm of earthquakes. And we've had thousands of earthquakes since that time. And Pearl Arte in La Perla, San Juan had a group of children who were living in a tent city because their homes had been destroyed over to their community center. And, and um, I think one of the things that this project has shown is the need for connectivity, the need to say, who is doing what? How can we work together? How can we support each other? And Laurel, you're a model for that. Thank you very much, Laurel. 
Um, Brenda, would you also like to talk about um, some of these ideas of the ways in which communities came together in the aftermath of Maria? Yes. Um, the reason my grandfather was able to get his dialysis was because of one of our community members, our neighbor. We would, after the hurricane, we would go there to play board games. And her father um, also was a dialysis patient and she came running towards my mom and was like, oh, the dialysis center has diesel right now. You have to go. You have to tell your husband to go get his father so you can go get the treatment. Um, and that's how my grandfather ha was able to start his treatment back again. Um, when we think about community, we often think about a, a lot of people and community response, a lot of like 50 people working together in a group. We, in my community, I was able to see it with individual people that just wanted to help. Um, when FEMA gave boxes to the municipalities, um, each governor of the municipality was responsible of distributing the goods. In Juncos, which is where I'm from, which is on the east side of the island, um, uh, of the main, main island, Puerto Rico, they were only given the goods to the urbanizaciones where they were a lot of people there. We live in the rural, rural part of the island. Um, the neighbors that we have are really old people because a lot of old people tend to live on the higher par parts of the mon mountains in Puerto Rico. Um, I remember, like it was yesterday, my dad, my brother, my uncles without shirts, with shorts and barefoot running down the hill and going to the people from the municipality. There's people up the mountain. We need to get to them. Like you guys need to come up the mountain. And they will be like, oh yeah, but we're distributing here first and then we will go there. And my dad, my brother, my uncle picking boxes, running up the hill, going back down, taking water, going up the hill, going house to house. And that's something that on the earthquakes we saw. Um, when the earthquake, earthquake started to hit the island, I remember a group of my friends were like, we need to send help. And all of this comes because of how during the hurricane, we didn't receive the help that we needed. The island, the people from the island, the community needed to rise up and do the work. And I remember going to the to the west side, which is a two hour drive from where I'm mm -hmm. from in Puerto mm -hmm. Rico, and just watching lines of pickup trucks full of supplies and supplies and food and tents. And I remember friends and a lot of people going doing Facebook events. Okay, on this day we're gonna meet here at 5 a.m. We're gonna fill up our pickup trucks and we're gonna go to the west side and we're gonna send food and we're gonna bring everything that they needed because we learned from Hurricane Maria and Hurricane Irma that if we as a community don't step up, the possibilities of our government doing so are really low. And that's something that I would forever have in my mind. And that's something that now I think that for a lot of people in Puerto Rico and from the diaspora is like the first response that they have when bad things happen on our island and on our sister islands. Yeah. Brenda, uh, thank you so much. That was very, very powerful. And, you know, one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about a lot recently is, uh, what is happening during the time of COVID-19. There are still 20,000 homes in Puerto Rico that are registered as still not having roofs after Hurricane Maria. We are now at the four year anniversary of Hurricane Maria and there are 20,000 homes on the register as not having roofs. We still have people who are displaced from the earthquakes. We still have unstable running water. We still have contaminated running water. How do you shelter in your home? How do you repeatedly wash your hands when your home is unsafe and your water is unsafe? Thank you uh, to the three of you for answering that question. I really appreciate that very much. Um, I'd like to transition as, as we come to the conclusion of our program this evening, I'd like to think a little bit about 
some other types of resources that people need after disaster. In my case, I knew that the reason why we were going back into the classroom is because the university campus could provide shelter. It could be a central location for some food distribution. We had some generators and some electricity there. Our running water was pretty stable. And even every once in a while, we could get some internet there. But when I returned to my classroom, I didn't know exactly what I was going to do. My partner and I stood in water lines for hours. We stood in gas lines for hours. And next to us were our students. How do we return to the classroom and pretend that business is as usual? I remember racing home so that we could get back to our home before the sun set after a full day of teaching, so that we could get the candles lighted, so that we could get the camp stone out, hook up the propane to the camp stove, figure out how many people we needed to feed that night and what was happening all before the sun set. And so when I was able to look for some resources for the classroom and to say, how do I go in and how do I teach through our new reality when I was the lucky one. The things I was doing after sunset were pretty easy compared to what some other people were doing. How do we honor and respect those experiences? How do we do the work that we need to do in the classroom while still honoring and respecting those ideas? One of the parts of the Voice of Witness partnership that was most attractive to me is that a curriculum to accompany each Voice of Witness book is developed and circulated for free. I was delighted and honored when my friend Syra, who is a narrator in this book, agreed to take all of her professional experience and bring it to the curriculum for the Mi Maria book. And before we conclude tonight, I'd just like to ask her to talk a little bit about what that curriculum looks like, the shape of that curriculum, and how it supports the book and supports not only uh, people in Puerto Rico who have gone through this experience, but as Laurel says, we are in a dangerous time right now. We are in a global climate crisis and people all around the world are unfortunately experiencing um, disasters similar to Maria. Syra, could you talk to us a little bit about the curriculum? It has been an honor to work on this curriculum. Of course, not an easy task either, but I have had the support of an amazing team uh, from Voice of Witness and their education division uh, spearheaded by Cliff Mayotte and Aaron Vaughn. We've also had the help of our curriculum advisory team of graduate and undergraduate students uh, from and also alumni of the University of Puerto Rico in Mayagüez, Brian Ramos and Brenda Flores, who is here with us today. And uh, we have been working on putting together lesson plans that, yes, they complement the Mi Maria Surviving the Storm book, but they are about much more than just that date in September four years ago. It also includes topics such as disaster preparedness, mm -hmm. which transcend this Caribbean archipelago and are still relevant to anyone who is living in this planet. So certainly it has topics that are pertinent to many of us, such as colonialism, representation and identity, globalization, and how our own connections and dependencies on with one another can be a positive thing. But at the same time, when we're speaking of a colony or vulnerable populations, populations that lack power, they can be very, very dangerous. So we're very proud uh, to share this curriculum that we'll launch with the book. And it has lesson plans in English and Spanish using the Puerto Rico Department of Education standards for local educators in the Caribbean archipelago but it also includes lesson plans in English aligned to the Common Core Standards. And they're also developed so that our English learners in the continental U.S. and the Caribbean can benefit and participate 
fully of this amazing book and the activities that are complementary. So we totally invite educators around the globe to get that curriculum and start working with Mi Maria in their classrooms. Thank you so much, Sarah. And I, I think that this is a particularly empowering curriculum for students, um, especially for those who um, are curious and already engaged with some of these issues. And my sincere hope is that this curriculum offers support for multiple teachers who are in the same position that I was after Hurricane Maria and looking for resources. Um, Brenda, if, I don't want to put you on the spot, but since you are a student who was involved in this project, you enrolled in two separate courses and then beyond the courses when you were not receiving credit for courses anymore, you worked with me as a partner on your father's narrative for years after those courses were done. Um, do you have any thoughts or insights that you'd like to share about being a student in the project? Yeah, of course. Um, I just remembered the bread of fresh air that it felt going into a classroom after such a traumatic event and have someone that we see as an authority ask, how are we doing? Um, not expect us to be on top of the syllabus or, okay, we left up here. Let's get back to it. No, there was a conversation. There was a safe, it was a safe space. Um, I always mention her because that professor and also you helped us, their students throughout this whole process so much. Um, Dr. Beatriz Jennings, she created a WhatsApp group for all of us. And I remember that for the students in, their in the classroom that didn't have internet yet, that didn't have running water, that electricity would go on and off. I remember that we would be sending text messages and be, oh, I have electricity in my apartment. Um, come, you can print here, you can work here, you can study here, do you want some food? So it was a really beautiful experience in the sense that we were able to have such a, build such a, a community inside of the academic um, stress that we were mm -hmm. going through currently, which was something that sadly, not all of the students going at the university had the opportunity. And I feel that what a curriculum that this book has, it opens that conversation for the professor, the teacher, and the student to see more than just a student in a class, a professor mm -hmm. in a class, but to also see the human and the necessities that they're going through. Because we truly don't know what people are going through in their houses. And after such a horrible event, it's really important to have it in, consider in consideration. So... It's something that I feel that should be really implemented yeah. in a lot of spaces, not only in the academic world, but also like in jobs and all of that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brenda. Um, uh, up until a, a little while ago, I focused a lot on how um, we, we at the university were all co-participants in a communal trauma and how um, that shared experience necessarily change things in our classroom. And I think that now we're all global, uh, globally, we're all co-participants in the shared trauma of COVID-19. And that will, again, uh, reshape classrooms. Um, I just want to conclude with, we had a, a wonderful moment in which we invited uh, some of, of the folks who were following along with Voice of Witness to send us some questions ahead of time. And uh, we were able to select one of those questions to present to the group today. And that question is, um, knowing that the damage caused by the storm and the subsequent response or lack thereof has yet to be fully addressed what are some of the things that we can do today to help support our family and fellow citizens in Puerto Rico? Um, can I ask uh, if, if someone in our group would like to respond to this very pertinent question? When we're standing by and we feel helpless looking at situations of trauma and tragedy, what are things that we can stand up and do? 
If I don't talk, I'm gonna explode, okay? Um, first of all, we Puerto Ricans do not vote and we don't have a voice. You Puerto Ricans from the diaspora are our beautiful fellow representatives. You should be talking to your congressmen. And not only that, you should be creating and forming associations of Puerto Ricans over there and running for, for the legislative positions and going for Congress and start getting into the system. That's what they don't want us to do. Please, that's the most important part. Second of all, you went there for better economic purposes, to better your finances, to get more money, a better life, buy property in Puerto Rico. We can manage your Airbnbs, we can manage your properties from here, but we do need for you to put your money back into the island, okay? Get some properties, they are right now available for all the beautiful people in the diaspora. We want you back on the island, okay? That's my message to you. I don't know if the girls want to say something more, but that's my part. <laughs> uh, Laurel, I'm going to come through the camera and give you a hug. Uh, thank you, Laurel, uh, for those those words. Um, I don't know if you can see this. In the book, there's a list of 10 things you can do. Make sure that when you get the book, you go to the back and you look at 10 things because we have a problem that we have U.S. citizens who cannot vote, and that is not okay. That is not okay. And uh, I second Laurel in saying, welcome home. Syra and Brenda, do you want to respond to this question as well? I'll just add uh, two more things, two concrete uh, things as well. I would love to invite you to hold your airline companies to hold your armed forces, to hold your maritime services accountable for helping the people of Puerto Rico when it, things go south and every day to improve our quality of life. I think that's a very concrete action. And of course, um, support local businesses. Many of us have our own e-commerce stores online mm -hmm. and we are quite capable. We are just committed to staying in the archipelago, but we can help you at a distance too. And we have amazing people on the island who could do services or products for you. I wanted to mention that if you feel that you don't know any resources or anywhere where you can find information, there's a lot. We spend a lot of time on social media and there are many, many social media accounts that are responsible of letting you know what's going on on the archipelago, letting you know all about our status as a colony. Uh, I have a, a mini list that I can mention. Las Fisuras de la Colonia, FEMCA, Consentimiento PR, Somos La Clara, Colectiva, La Colectiva Feminista, Brinken Podcast. These are all people that are in charge of saying what's going on and informing people from Puerto Rico, out of Puerto Rico, a part of the diaspora, and are not afraid of saying things how it is. So that's another research that I feel that is really important. Yeah, Brenda, thank you for preparing that list for us. I think that that was really helpful. Thank you. Um, I, I'm sorry that our time this evening is concluding. Um, I would like to say from, from my heart, thank you, Syra, Brenda, Laurel. Um, I always say that I can't believe how many friends I made in this project. I think that one of the things that, that, the Voice of Witness Fellowship does is it gives editors of these volumes the time, the time to spend with human beings without looking at your watch, without saying, oh my goodness, what comes next? And then amplifying stories so that these stories may be shared. So thank you to my three co-presenters for this evening for joining me. It was a beautiful conversation and I look forward to more conversations. I'd like to say thank you again to our hosts at Haymarket and Voice of Witness. Um, I'd like to say thank you to Marcy Denisak, who is the co-editor of this volume. 
I'd like to say thank you to Jocelyn Heliga Vargas, um, who was my co-teacher at the university. Um, I taught two of the first courses and she taught two of the first courses as well. So thank you to her. And I would like to say thank you to Emmanuel Rodriguez, Ramon Lopez Soto, Shania Tatiana Lynn Gonzalez, Wendy Diaz Diaz, Nilda Rodriguez Colazzo, Rafael Ramos Diaz, Vivian Miranda Rodriguez, Jose Garcia Sepulveda, uh, Carlos Bonilla Rodriguez, Sandra and Israel Gonzalez, Bel Marie Torres Velasquez, Nish Irizarry Ortiz, Carlos Figueroa Vasquez, Luis Flores Lopez, who is Brenda's dad, Miliana Ivelisa Montañez Leon. Those are the narrators who have shared their stories, shared their souls with us in this book. I hope you have time to enjoy this book. I hope you have this time to share these stories. And I hope that you are moved to support the people of Puerto Rico. Thank you and have a beautiful night. A pesar de lo pesar en Borin que sigue. A pesar de los pesares, Borín quien vive. A pesar de los pesares, Borín quien sigue. A pesar de los pesares,